We're back. We are back. We are back. This is going to be really good. The rollout. Two episodes over 70 minutes. Hey guys, thanks so much for clicking on the video. This is my review for American Horror Story. This is season 10. This is, listen, Ryan then rolled out two episodes. Each episode was more than 70 minutes, okay? So this is the double feature. It's double feature. The first part of this was called Cape Fear. Let's just do, I'm going to break this down because it's going to be too much to unpack in one video. So I'm going to do two separate videos. We're going to do episode one, which is Cape Fear. It's called Cape Fear. Um, we're going to start here and we're just going to do two videos because there's no need for me to try to keep you that long. It'll be like I'm making a movie myself, which is not all that bad, but let's get started. Double feature, Cape Fear, part one. Let's go. Okay, so listen here. We got a little family, and they're rolling through what looks to be the desert. For the most part, I'm like, okay, where are they going? There's a little girl in the back. Um, her name is Alma. And then you got the husband, Harry. And then you got the wife. She's pregnant. She's pregnant. And literally, you, you hear Alma in the back, and she's counting. She's counting. And I'm like, what are you counting? And she said, roadkill. So already I'm looking at her like, where is Laura coming from? What get? She counting roadkill, okay? And you see just little stuff dead on the side of the road and as they're going. And as they're talking about her, she's just, you know, she had counted up to nine and she's like, 10. And the father, he slams on the brakes. Because right in front of him, it's a whole reindeer. Like literally a whole reindeer. And he, he pulls over to the side of the road. He gets out. And this is where, see. First mistake. Who gets out of their car in the middle of the desert? Why? Why? Why are you getting out of the car in the middle of the desert? But they're because when they rolled up to this, they were talking about the fact that little girl was saying, you know, why is it always so sad when other things are dead? Other than, you know, when like the fact of if it's a squirrel or a rat, you know, the feelings are different than if it's a cat or a dog. And then boom, here we go. Number 10 is this reindeer, this whole reindeer. And proves her right. He pulls over. He gets out. He goes over and the, the mother says, you know, hey, don't touch it. You know, you get Lyme disease and this, that thing, and the other. Very true, man. Very true. He notices right away, but never says anything. And I said, you know, and it, it becomes a pattern with him. You'll see him do things as we go forth and he keeps it to himself. Mm. We find out he's a writer. Mm. I can, you know, I don't tell everything. I keep what I want and then I, I use it as I need it. <laughs> so I guess I understand, but some things like you, you, I just didn't understand why he didn't share. But the whole thing he noticed about the reindeer is that it wasn't hit by a car or anything. It wasn't uh, mangled. It was mutilated. The throat was was literally torn out. But he didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. Just kept just kept right on going. And they go ahead and they get there to Provincetown. They're in Cape Cod. Let me just say this right away. This whole thing is giving me very Stephen King. All of it. This is very Stephen King. Very Salem's Lot. Very um, Storm of the Century. V very much... I, I got those vibes as I was going through this total Salem's Lot and uh, Storm of the Century. Storm of the Century is one of my favorite Stephen Kings. But I'm like, okay, um, 
all right, whatever. But anyway, we get there, the whole setup, the way it's filmed, everything, very much the beginning of a Stephen King movie. So I said, okay, this is going to be a long journey. We meet Martha. Martha is the manager of this home. Um, as we get there, Alma says, this house looks haunted. It was a little airy. It had a little murder house feel to it. You know, it just kind of a city. We, we've seen beautiful homes coming into Provincetown. And then we got to this one and it really was very aged, like old cheese. I said, you know, some people like all that. And as we found out that the mother, she's pretty much, she's an influencer. Um, so she does some things on Instagram and also, she's more of an um, interior decorator, okay? So right away, strange things. We meet Martha. Martha's the manager. She basically does the taking care of and the, the working on the renting out of this place and all of this. They're literally there. He's a writer. Like I said, he's experienced in some writer's block. They're from New York. They've come here, there's Stephen King, for him to write you know, to clear his mind and write. He's he's doing screenplays and all of this. It's like, okay, cool. Of course, you know, every time when we get to this kind of stuff, there's there's more underneath the surface. Shit's usually screwed up back at home, but whatever. Um, I did notice that Martha became a bit irritated because she was saying, so she was looking around at just different little things that they brought in and the mother had brought a few things. She says, don't try to change things, you know, don't change anything too much. And that's when the mother said, oh, well, you know, I've gotten the okay from the owner, the Browns. You know, she told me, you know, that was part of the thing and, you know, part of payment and everything to go ahead and do whatever I want. I do interior decorating. I'm actually here to redo the place. And Martha looked very irritated very irritated as if it was her own property and how dare you. I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. So that was that. Um, we go on from there. Right after that, Alma says, and Alma's got to be about nine or ten. It's like nine or ten years old. And I think she's nine. But she's like, I'm going to go find my room. This, is a, this house is huge, okay? Who just lets their nine-year-old just run off into a house that they don't know nothing about it? You just... Whatever. Anyway, she's never going to find my room. And then Harry goes on out the door. He go walking to the market. I see the market back here. He's going to go to the market. He walks instead of drives. That didn't make a whole lot of sense, but okay. And it's, get, it's right around dusk at this time. And you start seeing... Um, People turning on lights, a lot of red lights. No, kept noticing like these red lights. I was like, what is that? Very eerie looking to me, just strange, a little, a little strange, very Stephen King-esque. So that was that. He goes on to the, to the market. He gets to the market and right away we meet Karen. Funny her name would be Karen. <laughs> we meet Karen. Karen looks like a base head, okay? Karen is whacked out. She looks a mess. She looks very homeless. Um, very tweakish. Okay. And we meet Mikey. Mikey basically is running the, the market. Mikey tells Karen, because Karen tells uh, Harry, get out of this town. And she cussed him out. Get out of this town. You know, she told him, they're going to munch on your balls here. Tell him you get out of this town. Get out. I'm warning you. Mike said, Karen, girl, go ahead on about your business, Karen. Go on about your business. So he's like, oh, strange. And that's that. So that's that. He gets his little things, goes on back to the house. Just very strange. Very strange. He never says anything. Again, doesn't tell the wife anything. Doesn't say a word. Oh, we're going to be fine. It's this, that thing, and the other. Next thing we see, the next day, you got the mother and Alma. They go out. They're walking. There's a cemetery. 
It was like this flat. So in, in there, the cemetery, everything was very common. Like as far as you know how, where I live, I live in Pittsburgh. Cemeteries are gated. They are away from, you know, there are sometimes there's houses near cemeteries, but for the most part, cemeteries are in spaces, you know, they, they're in their own space, you know. Um, when I went to New Orleans, you, in New Orleans, the cemetery seems like a more common space where it's no big deal. You know what I mean? Um, and a lot of times with us here, cemeteries are on here. I live, there's a lot of hills here. So cemeteries a lot of times set up on hills and things like that. But anyway, it was very, very, just very common and very flat out. And here they are, they're walking. You know, the mother and Alma, can't think of the mother's name right now, but they're walking and they're just talking and everything. And then they see this really, like I, we see him first. He's very pale and he's kind of tall and kind of thin. And he just looks, he just has a strange presence. Very strange, very zombie-esque, okay? Um, very Salem's Lot, Okay. So they're seeing him from a distance. We're looking from a distance. We see him. And I'm like, oh, okay, so he's watching them. But then we notice they see him too. And the mother's like, okay, come on. So, you know, they can start doing like the fast paced walk. Like, let's just go. Because they notice that he noticed them. He starts coming. And then he speeds up as they speed up. And then it ends up turning into a whole damn chase. He's literally chasing them. I mean, on him. And remember, she's pregnant and she got a nine year old. And she, baby, they booking. He chased them all the way back to the house. Chased them to the house. They literally just get in the door. Baby, they slam the door. He bang, banging on the door, banging on the window. Wait a minute. Hold on. What you doing? What is this banging and chasing? See, I, I, we got an issue. I think I might have been startled at first with the chase, but then I think I would have got irritated at, wait a minute, <laughs> are you really chasing? I don't even know you. And you're like chasing me. Try is chasing. And then banging. And she's like, he's trying to get us. And there she's like on the floor and the husband, he's Harry's looking out the window at him. They end up calling the, the police. We, chief of police comes, it's a African-American woman. She's a you know, female and everything. She comes, she got another little guy with her. And they basically are just talking. And we notice the teeth, his teeth. Really jagged teeth. Very, the hills have eyes teeth. They gotta, the police have this excuse for everything. Excuse for everything. And I was like, why does it feel like the police are trying to explain everything away? Oh, yes, these people come here. It's a lot of like drugs and opioids and different things like that. So, we'll, we'll, you know, but everything, you'll be very safe here. Everything's cool here. You know, we'll, we're going to do a little roundup and we'll make sure we drive the junkies back to where they've come from. You know, be it's no problem. Man. Nothing's a problem. Very suspect. Everything just seemed very suspect. The cops, like they knew something that they weren't saying. And they were basically blaming everything on drugs and opioids. And I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, 2021, that's the thing. You know, any strange behavior, put it on opioids. So that was that. She noticed as well when she was looking at the footprints, the footprints were completely flat. Completely flat. And I said, that's strange. Completely flat. What shoes? are completely flat with no treads at all, especially in a place like Cape Cod. There's water everywhere. Like there's all this water and all of this. And she did told him, don't go swimming. And, you know, but it's ice cold. It's winter time as well. So, you, you know, no snow, but winter. She knows that the, the footprints are flat. She says nothing. Harry says something about a massacre, a family massacre story. Um, and he calls the people's names out. And later on, he ends up Googling. Because she just, oh, no, you know what? 
that was another thing, you know, there was some drug stuff and, you know, that is like a whole, like a cartel or something. They came and that was, you know, isolated. It. That's the, everything has to do with drugs. I said, okay. So he ends up Googling it. I found out later all this stuff about throats being torn out. Their throats were torn out. Very strange. Very strange. So later on that night, Alma's up there in a the bed and she ends up hearing somebody throwing like little pebbles at the window. She goes to the window. She sees the man that had chased them. And he got two more of them with him. They all, they, they're all dressed the same. They all very, you know, they all got their little Salem's Lot thing. And, and now they playing Salem's Lot games. And then they doing junkie stunts, honey. They throwing rocks at the windows and carrying on. I said, you know what, this is a mess. So she screams. And father comes in. He's like, you sure you didn't have a nightmare? Blah, 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 blah. Now they explaining things away. Alma's like, mm hmm now, you have to know about Alma. Alma, she's a nine-year-old, and she's, I, I figured right here, okay, you know, generally, you take to children right away. You're like, why are we here? Why do we have children in the storyline? I said, this is going to bother me. I know it's going to bother me because people, you know, harm coming to the children is going to bother me. And I was like, oh. But then shortly in, you find out, Alma is a bit snarky with her little nine-year-old self. So you kind of start looking at her like she's still a child and I don't want any harm to come to her, but she's just a little too intuitive. She's a little too snarky. She's a bit much. She's a bit much. And I said, she's going to be an issue. You know, she her responses are very, and she, she's, you know, she's very much, she feels she's the smartest person in the room. She's only nine. I said, oh, Miss Alma, you're going to get on my nerves. I can see it. Some stuff is probably going to happen with you, all due to the fact that you think you know everything, Miss Alma, and you're not going to be listening. And you're going to probably have some issues, Miss Alma. But um, yeah, and if there's any type of entities around that want to take over something, Alma would definitely be the person, to, you know, just jump on in her because she already wants some bullshit. But anyway, anyway, I'm see here. I'm just dragging Miss Alma. But anyway, she's going to be an issue. <laughs> she's not this little innocent nine-year-old. She just has a way about her that's just really a bit too much for me. Not my style. But anyway. She goes and she sleeps with her mother that night. So her father's downstairs um, in the morning. And he had started taking himself a little drink. He didn't got drunk, baby. He ain't typed nothing. He he literally is suffering from a writer's block. He ain't typed a thing. He ends up going on over. He laying over there on the couch. He's knocked out drunk sleep. The mother comes down and she's like, you want me to get you some coffee? He's like, yeah, please. So he gets out. Uh, he's sitting there. Miss Alma come down. She says, you know that in the army, they shoot you for being sleep on guard. I said, is that right, Miss Alma? Girl, you better go somewhere and sit down. She's, she's a lot. She's a lot. So anyway, old boy gets up. He leaves. Now that stuff didn't happen. This is the other thing. Now, all that happened, he ends up leaving them by themselves again, and he goes all jogging. It's the middle of the day, early. He goes jogging, and he's running along the shore and runs right into two men. There are two men laying guts literally just ripped out. Their guts are ripped out. He throws up. Next thing you know, the police are called in. You know, they come down. Here come the police. They got more excuses he's asking them about these wounds like what would actually it's the chief of police again and then there's a male with her and what type of animal would would create those type of wounds and he says yeah i'm thinking a great white and he's like well wait a minute a great white first so close to the shore and secondly don't they migrate to warmer water 
it's that water is like freezing cold. It's winter time. So wouldn't great whites be in a warmer climate? He just cut him off. I, I'll know more once I do the autopsy. What the hell does an autopsy have to do with this ripped out gut right now? Like, seriously? You go, how much more are you going to cut the body open to figure something out? I said, child, here we go. They know that it's always an excuse. They got another story for every story. Old boy goes home. He still ain't said nothing to the wife. Ain't said a word. Says nothing. He and her. Um, the, let me tell you another thing, a little bit more about this. Alma, Alma plays the uh, violin. And she, she has these goals, okay? She wants to be professional. She wants to be the first professional person at the age of 18 to play like the Grand Orchestra and all of this here in New York City and all of this. And he basically, I thought it was kind of shady because he says to her, like, mm, that's like a large goal. And his toed toward it was kind of, he was trying to tell her about her playing because she was playing her violin and it was irritating him. He's kind of like blaming it on the, the aggravation from the, you know, she's like, but if I get, I'm going to get into the symphony, then I want to be perfect. And he's like, oh, so some of this is making sense with why almost the way she is. She's a creative. So she's a perfectionist. She's snarky because she's narcissistic and she has all this going on at nine at nine. Um, sad thing, but it's a lot of some of our traits. Some creative people have these traits and they are a bit much. I don't feel like, I, I have traces of these things. You know, I'm, I'm just going to admit it. When it comes to my work, I do have some narcissistic tendencies about my work. Um, I can be snarky when need, need be, but um, I'm old enough and mature enough to, to know how to not offend, you know, unless I choose to. But there are a lot of creatives that, especially in the areas of, areas of music and dance, very narcissistic. Sorry if I'm stepping on anybody's toes, but you all know what I'm talking about. If you are running around, you know what we're talking about. You all know what I'm talking about. Perfect example ballerinas are they very nice people most times they're like swans they're very gorgeous they're very beautiful what they do is very beautiful but if you get too close they might peck you way before a pigeon would peck you a swan will probably you before a pigeon would ever harm you it's just the way it is <laughs> ballerinas but anyway, anyway, they're one of the most beautiful things up on the stage, but probably the shadiest one. When you get to a meet and greet, probably the shadiest one on the, on the whole cast. But anyway, okay, look, down off my soapbox, but I'm bump on Batman. Miss Alma, I get you, girl. I get it. So the father, basically, he kind of hits her with a little snarky piece, which is probably where she got it from. He's a writer. And he tell you know, basically like, mm, 18, huh? On the symphony, mm, okay. And then she hit him back with something about his script. And says, well, you know, if everyone loves the script that you did so much, why so many rewrites and edits? I said, oh, she didn't let his ass have it. That read his ass down. I said, oh. So you, we know Miss Alma hears and sees more than she leaves on. She, she's mm -hmm. just like a child, honey. See everything that you think she didn't see. She's seen it all. So anyway, so we got that going on. So listen. All right. So that night, the father decides he's going to take the mother out to, there's a, a little restaurant that's close. She says, we'll take, we're going to go down and we have some stuff. We're just going to go on down and we're going to have some dinner. Now, he was just out and there was two dead bodies. And y'all are going to go. Y'all don't know anybody here. Alma again. She says to the father, did you check her credentials? I said, what are you talking about? 
Come and find out here. They done hired Martha to come to babysit. You don't know Martha. Who leaves their nine-year-old in a new town with a woman that they ain't never met? You met Martha for three minutes when she handed you the keys to the building or you going to leave your baby with her? I said, child, these people are crazy. These people are losing their minds. But that just makes sense as to why they're there. Because with these, they've only been here less than a week. They ain't been here with child. They ain't been here three days. And all this, that we done got two dead boys, Chase Tone. Why have you met on two occasions the chief of police? And you ain't been somewhere three days. And now you're going to leave your baby. Oh, you met a, a meth head or whatever, tweaking in a store, all this. And you're going to leave your baby with some broad that you ain't never. And the only person that got enough sense to say, did you check her credentials? Is Alma, the one that need the babysitter. Does Alma really need the babysitter or do you need the babysitter? Alma got better sense than you all. Same. Anyway, like I said, if there's an entity around that needs to really jump in and get some damage done, yeah, Alma will be the one that you want to jump into because she's the one with the best sense in this group. But anyway, moving on, they're like, oh, no, everything's going to be fine, blah, 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 blah. Saved by the bell. The wife gets sick. You know she's pregnant. But she says, you know, it's just weird because... Um, it's too late for like morning sickness this evening. And she's like kind of far into her pregnancy. She's like, I don't know, just don't, just don't feel well yet, whatever. So he puts her up in the bed and she tells him, well, you know, you go ahead, you go and, and just have your name and thing. I'm just going to lay here for a minute, whatever. Go ahead, you go. He's like, are you sure? She's like, yeah, go ahead without me. I said, okay. So that's that. And then he says to her, now, remember, they just had all this stuff go on. Alma just asked her about the babysitter and all that. He says to the wife, and this struck me, I said, what kind of backwards shit is this? He says to the wife, well, what if the weirdos come back? The ones, you know, the one that ran up to the door, the one, you know, because remember, said it was the same one. Alma said she seen him, and then with two other people outside her window, okay? So what if the weirdos come back? So now that you're going to the restaurant alone, the restaurant bar alone, and you're going to leave your wife there, you're worried about if the weirdos come back. But you weren't worried about if the weirdos came back when you leave your daughter there with the woman that you don't know that's from there. And I'm thinking, okay, so is Martha going to come and sit in with the wife and the daughter? But no, Martha, they told Martha don't even bother and she said, oh, no, we're going to be fine. Okay, no problem, no problem. Weird. Didn't make any sense at all, but okay. So he goes on to the bar. And first thing he meets, he meets this little hustler, little gay hustler down in the bar. And baby, he's giving, oh, wow fresh meat, right? <laughs> so he's like, uh, I'm married, very married, but thank you. I'm, I appreciate it, but no, not my, you know, you're not my flavor. Um, at this time, we actually see Sarah in Austin, okay? And they're up there. It's like a karaoke thing. And I said, I'm looking at them and I said, oh, so is this a gay bar? And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I guess everybody, everybody just kind of is, it's Cape Cod, so it's kind of small. So everybody's just hanging out. You know, but it seems like everybody in the bar was a, the lady that was running it. She seemed a little butch. And I said, like, you know, it just is what it is. Everybody comes with everybody. Come on, it's 2021. Let's go. It's, it's cool. So then a drink gets sent. Austin and Sarah sent the drink over to Harry. Harry goes over. They meet each other and they're like, oh, we, we kind of notice you. You know, we're writers, you know, and then they say who they are. And then Sarah says who she is. And she says, but you know, I write under the pseudonym of Belle. 
And he's like, oh my God, I know your stuff. You know, and he's like, she says, you like romance novels? He's like, no, but your stuff is so much deeper. It's so good. And then Austin, he's like, you know, I, you know, yeah, I'm Austin, blah, 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 blah. He knows their work. He knows their, they are famous. And uh, they have this whole conversation there about, he says, well, I would think, you know, most people come up in the summertime. He says, no, but we actually come in the winter versus the summer. And it just works. You know, something about this place in the winter, we come and he's like, just is what it is. Now, right away, there was like this homoerotic thing going on with Austin as well. I said, is Austin taking a little liking to Harry? I said, okay, yeah, yeah whatever. So was what it was. And the little hustler, Kind of like after he shooed him off. That was that. Then we look, here come Karen. Karen comes into the bar. And she ends up like, she's just messy. She comes in. She's hollering at the, the lady running the place. She says, just shut up. Just want the scraps. Just the fat. I want this fat on there. You ain't going to do it, but throw it away anyway. And she like scraping off, off the plate onto the thing. I said, well, look up. She's like this forceful homeless broad that just comes in and just whatever. Like, girl, Miss, okay, Miss, uh, Miss Karen, girl. And she turns around and she sees Harry and she says, I warned you, I told you to get away from here. I warned you about this place. Sit and stay away from those two blood sucking. I said, oh, Miss. Karen. Yeah, Karen's real, her mouth is real colorful. And they were looking at her like, girl, shut it up, honey. Get on about your way, honey. So that was that. They had their little drink. They talked to him. They're like, oh, we just live. I don't live that far. You know, it's that the other. We'll never run into each other again. You know, it could be great. Uh, we've had great, great uh, success from being up here, definitely in the wintertime. I think this will work with you. He was telling them, you know, how he was having the writer's block and blah, 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 say, blah, say, blah. Really good conversation. Had a few drinks. He goes ahead on home. They go on about their way. He goes home. Ciao. He's not home very long. He gets up there. He checks on. Oh, wait. Back up. Back up. He calls the wife from the restaurant. And he's talking to her. You know, he's talking to her. And, uh, She is saying, oh, no, everything's fine. He's like, you still want that steak or you want that burger? Because he's there a little longer than expected. She's like, no, actually, um, Alma fell out sleep. She's sleeping real sound and good. And I'm actually getting ready to go ahead and go to sleep. I'm glad you enjoy yourself. Just go ahead and enjoy yourself. They're singing. You, you can hear people singing in the background. He said, just enjoy yourself. He's like, okay. And as she hangs up and then she's like tucking herself down and really getting comfortable down in there, the camera pans over and there's there's a way in which these people, let me tell you, because there were like literally at this point, there were five of the people. There was the guy and there was like four other ones. Now, they're outside her window and they're like tweaking, but they do this like pop and snap thing. Like it's a real pop snap thing. It's really weird. Like real Salem's lot weird. I'm like, what are they? And you can hear like their bones cracking and popping. Weird. And there's like five of them outside her window. I said, oh shit, honey. So he ends up coming home. He don't see nobody. He just comes in. He checks on the wife, checks on the daughter, closes the doors, goes downstairs. He puts some, he had put some water on for some tea or coffee or whatever. And you hear it buzz. And then you hear a little banging where the window cause was kind of open. He pours himself the hot water. He goes and sits it down and he hears the window and he goes back and he closes the window. Well, when he closes the window, you can see old boy that got up in the house, honey. And you can see him standing over in the side. Baby, when he goes to walk back in the room, boyfriend jumps out and grab him and baby, they get to tussling. They get to tussling. They get to tussling. And you can see these teeth, honey. And he's just at him. And he's, I mean, they're going at it. And there's one point where it took it and 
to him onto the table and he like hits the table like forward and then he like and he flips over and he's like I said oh child it was a whole lot going on and he looking at him and baby they was getting it they getting it so old boy gets him throw him down and he's like trying to get at him at, you know them titties trying to get he took a poker there was a poker it fell over on the side fell. took the poker and bashed well old boy and then took it and just down in his eye and just bashed his damn head in he fucked him out as he should have and that was that period so then you look at honey a whole mess a whole mess here comes the cops again. The cops come. It's a whole episode. The cops got excuses for it. And they actually, literally, they cleaned the scene and everything. They cleaned the blood. There's a little left on the side of the wall, but they didn't even see it until the next day. We seen it ourselves. We'll splash the blood the next day. Alma seen it though the next day. They cleaned it up and everything. Alma's still upstairs. The wife said, I told Alma to stay upstairs. She don't know what's going on. And everything like that cleaned everything up here the cops have complete uh, another story about everything oh no everything's gonna be fine you'll come down tomorrow and you'll make a um we'll take you know do some talking tomorrow do a full report and everything like that because they had to take this body away okay and he says yeah he says you know it's nothing but a tweaker who literally is trying to come in somewhere and steal a stereo you know just all had up out of his mind and all of this and he says are you sure he's like she's like yes everything will be fine tonight um you know we'll see you in the morning things are totally different here than in new york you have full rights if someone comes in your house you have rights to end them if they come into your home and try to harm you when you're here it's not like new york city you know you're a fool in your rights. Everything is just fine. And he said, but it feels like he tried to, he tried to bite my throat out. It feels like that's what he came for. And she's like, mm. and they go on and they leave. Go on and they leave. And then he tells the wife, um, she says, well, you know, it's okay. Thank you so much for protecting us and keeping us safe. He said, yeah, it's, it's okay. She's like, I'm sure we're going to be safe. He said, oh, no, I, I know we're going to be safe because we're leaving. We are leaving. And she says, um, well, you do realize I have a job. I got a job to do here too. He's like, well, yeah, I mean, but you know, with everything that had actually happened, you know, this, that thing and the other, I just kind of figured you would want to and she's like, well, I mean, whatever, whatever you want to do, it's fine. He said, what the? Now keep in mind, when she was getting sick, she can't realize, can't figure out why she was sick. She was up there googling Lyme disease too. She was, she didn't know like what was going on with her. She's googling Lyme disease, and she didn't want to be there in the first place. She the, in the very beginning, Alma had asked her, you know, do you like her? She's like, eh. Okay, you know, I'm a city girl. I like the hustle and the bustle of the city, but you know, it's cool. You know, she's trying to schmooze it over. She ain't want to be there herself. So I'm like, why the change of heart now? What's going on with you? But anyway, enough about them. Let's flip and go over to we see Belle and the little hustler guy. Maybe they didn't, they in the bed, then getting down. She didn't, then turned a little trick with him. And she's saying to him, yeah, um, she says, are you going to let me? And he's like, no, Belle, last time you went too far. You went too far. She got real testy. She says, you're going to let me drink or you're not getting shit. She's offering like more money. And he's like, no, Belle. She's like, you're going to let me drink or you're not getting shit. And he's like, fine. And baby, she basically takes out her flipper. She had a flipper, the little fake teeth thing, 
And baby, she got the old jagged teeth. And she takes her little necklace and she slices his wrist and she drinks blood from his wrist. I said, oh. So now this is given very hotel. Remember hotel with Lady Gaga and all of that, the vampires and all that? I said, oh. Okay. I guess. They got on my nerves back then. I was like, hmm. <sighs> okay, whatever. Here we go. So, that was that. Then we see Karen. Karen's also digging in the garbage. And the, her bag is vibrating. She has this cell phone. I said, where'd she get a cell phone from? She almost, where'd she get a cell phone? And this was the other thing. Belle was saying, you know, I know there's a few of you hustlers, I guess a, a bunch of gay boys that all stay in a house together and it just doesn't have adequate stuff. Belle got money. And so he's like, you know, it's real warm over there and all of this kind of carrying on. You know, it's just warm over here, blah, blah, blah. You know, all these little things she was trying to use to get what she wanted. Whatever. All of that. So when she answers her cell phone, it's, they're like, Okay, and she said, I just can't, I can't. And she's crying. And she, and the, it's Belle on the phone. And Belle says, you have three hours. And she hangs up on her. And then we actually see her there. She goes to the house. She lets her in. And Belle, this part just wore me out. Belle, she's like... I don't like this. I, I just, I hate it. This, that, and the other. And I, I just, I can't do it. She said, you don't do it. She said, you want to be close to greatness. And this is why you do it. She says, you know, I, I basically do this so that you could protect me because you keep me protected from the others. And she said, no, you really do it for this. And she goes, and she got like crystal meth, basically. And she throws it on the floor to her. She said, now give it to me. You do it for that. You don't do it for you do it for that. I said, oh, girl, so she's all tweaked out. She gives her the bag. And in the bag, it's crying. There's a baby inside that bag. She said, oh, get out of here. I said, Belle, you over there draining and eating babies? Ugh! So Karen's running around stealing people's babies and shit. I said, oh, this is just too much. Too much. You oh, took her a newborn. I said, oh. All right, whole lot. And you can see when Karen leaves, she's she's old high bitch, but very tormented. And you should be tormented, Karen, because girl, you know, you're going to burn in hell for that girl, but whatever. So she goes on and that's that. I said, okay, so, all right, so Belle got something going on. Austin and Belle are like this. So I said, what's really going on? So go on the next day we're getting ready to go Alma comes on steps and says I don't want to go back to New York and she's kind of just standing there and he's like Alma we're leaving we, we, we're going to go everything's going to be fine trust me we're going to find another we're just going to go back to New York just until we can find another place he said, look, I said, look up some other place. He gave her a couple little locations to, to Google. said, you'll love them. It, it'll be fine. And we'll, it, we're not going to be back in New York long. And then she says, well, I guess this house is haunted now. And she looks over to where the body was actually laying. So I said, see, Miss Alma, she knows everything. She sees and hears everything. She's really nosy and very snarky. I said, oh, and she runs on back up the steps. So that was a mess. Um, then the next thing you know, we get a phone call and it's Austin. Austin's telling Harry, he says, come over to my place. And he's like, well, you know, actually this is not a good time. And he's like, you know, I really appreciate, but we're actually getting ready to leave. He's like, oh, please, before you go, you have to come by. It may change your mind. Just, just come by. So he ends up going on over there and he ends up telling him, about how because he's like I'm going to tell you how to get rid of that writer's block even if you don't stay to help you out 
So he goes and he basically tells him about these black pills. And he's asking him, what are they? Where do they come from? What's in them? What's the side effect? He's like, I don't really like stuff like this. I just, I can't get into it. And he's like, well, just keep on doing what you're doing. He says, see, obviously you're not a real writer. Because if you were a real writer, then you would give whatever to make sure that those words, those beautiful words, get. he was really playing on his psyche. I said, oh, I see you, Miss Austin, honey. I see you. And he, Again, there were, again, there was this whole homoeroticism going on. Very much, see, that clicked to me. I said, uh -huh, I see it. Because when you think vampires, there's always a lot of homoeroticism between the males. Always. Always. It's always a sexual tension going on. I said, mm -hmm. you get ready to get gas. But anyway, so he takes and he puts the pills in his pocket and he's like, oh, come on, Harry. And he's like, all right, Austin. And he's like, and that's the thing, because he told me to say he didn't want to drink, but he came in, he's like, I don't like to drink during the day. He said, well, this is the trick to get drunk. He said, and then the thing is, you don't know when you're drunk or when you're not totally drunk. So that's like the trick. You just keep drinking. I was like, oh, oh my God, he's a mess. He's a whole whack job. So he ends up he ends up leaving. Austin's he's still saying he's going. In the meantime, he ends up getting a call from New York from one of his upper folk. And she's like, Whoa, wait a minute, what do you mean you're leaving? He didn't go into all of what had happened, but he told, I'm on my way back to New York. She's like, No, you're not. Now listen, this is the thing. Let me be real with you. Let me be real with you. Basically, your career is hanging in the balance. You ain't got no six months to be playing around with no screenplay. You need to get that shit done like yesterday. So whatever it is, suck it up, get to writing, and then come on with the product. I ain't trying to hear that bullshit you're talking about. You're going to mess around and you're not going to have a career. So that's that. And she hung up. I said, exactly. So I knew there was a, some underlying turmoil as you know pertains to their real life so at this point he's like pressed and he ends up taking the black pill and guess who sees him take it oh my she see him take the black pill i said oh and that's where part one actually ends that's why i told you all i was going to do this in two separate pieces because there was so much to actually unpack. So, thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. This is going to be very interesting. It's totally different than what I was thinking. I, I was thinking something about mermaids and sirens, and I'm not giving up on that theory just yet because I don't know exactly what those things are. But, <clears throat> listen, it's a double feature. So we will see what opens up from here. Thank you all for watching. Like I said, I will catch you in the next video for the second part. American Horror Story. Don't you just love it? Later.